gratifying images of God is the image of God the Father and then God the Son and the Holy Spirit, of course, but God the Father and the Son and the idea of this interaction between our Heavenly Father and His Son and to, for us to be able to think of God in the type of Father relationship that He is called our Heavenly Father. So today I'd like to talk about a father's example and primarily our, every father's example is God the Father. So I'll answer that question very quickly. And as a father myself, it's a great privilege and I'm sure any father would say that to be able to have children it was mid-fall of 1993 that Christy told me I was going to be a daddy. Uh, somehow mothers seem to know that first and let us know. And so she told me something that night that would change my life for good. I was going to be the father. And I remember thinking how much that was going to change my life, or at least I, I had some idea. Now, I didn't have exactly all the idea of how that was going to change my life. But I remember going to bed that night, even, and just sitting on the side of the bed uh, in a prayerful attitude saying, Lord, I'm about ready to start on a, a journey that I feel very intimidated by. And yet, I was gratified at the perspective of having a son or a daughter. At that time, I didn't know which. This began the greatest calling of my life. Raising my sons is the greatest overall calling of my life. And I had this attitude when I was raising my sons. I'm not just raising my boys. I am raising the fathers of my grandchildren. And so I try to think that one day, possibly these boys will be fathers themselves. And I wanted to raise godly men that would be a good husband and a good father. And I've had this attitude also. I have three sons. I have felt that I would accomplish more through my three sons than anything I would actually do myself. So if I could train them as, as much as possibly could, there would be a day that they would be cast out away from the home. Now, I, I didn't throw them out. <laughs> they left. They found their wives and they left. And I found that day, I was kind of sad for all three of them as they left. But if you have your Bible, you'd like to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm taking a break from Nehemiah for a Sunday. And actually centering around this theme of the Father's example. I don't often preach sermons connected to um, special days or holidays. Now, I certainly do around Easter and Christmas, Thanksgiving. But, for instance, I don't usually always preach a Fourth of July sermon, you know, or even Mother's Day or Father's Day. But today, I, I just felt this was on my heart during the latter part of this week. So, with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, Children, obey your parents as you would the Lord. Or the King James Version would say, in the Lord. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and you may have long life in the land. Oh, there's a lot of discussion about what that means connected to that promise. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Today we celebrate Father's Day, and I ran across a short bit of information 
about Father's Day, and that is that Calvin Coolidge was the president who first uh, cited Father's Day as a celebration in our country, and it's a good time to celebrate our Father. It is my hope that you have had a good experience with your father. I'm well aware, though, that some of our families look a little different, and we have a variety of experiences with both mothers and fathers, and I have seen the hurt that even Mother's or Father's Day can bring to people as sometimes they recognize their fathers might not have been as faithful as they would like. And unfortunately, that is a problem that is prevalent in our country today. I'm glad that it's no more prevalent than it is, but many fathers have not been faithful and left broken homes, single mothers with children, and caused a lot of anguish and struggle within the family unit. Now, first of all, my prayer for every father is that they be a godly father. That's simple. Children, obey your parents as you would the Lord or in the Lord. And this is reflective of a father that is a godly father. The, resp the spiritual responsibility for the home, and this is no discredit to the mother, but the spiritual responsibility for the home is the father according to scriptures and it's very hard for a father to be a good father without being a godly father now today i don't want to preach to fathers and i'm certainly not wanting to uh, discredit any father but i would hope and pray that you have to be a godly father to be really very blessed. And if we have or have had a godly father, thank the Lord for that. Over in Virginia, I saw a lot of fathers that were really good fathers. And on occasion, I would go speak to their adult sons. And I would say to them, have you ever thought, of the blessing that you have in your father. And I would say to them, you know, I know your, your dad. And I have known him for several years. And I see what his priorities are in his life. I see how he is involved, uh, not only with the church, but he has a relationship with the Father God. And so I would ask these, uh, they weren't youngsters, but these sons, especially was ones I would, would speak to about this, I would say, remember your father and be thankful that you have had a godly father. What a joy it is for children to obey their parents as in the Lord. How, how much of a joy is that to have? And just to give you an illustration of how even my family is different, I did not grow up with mom and dad. And it's really not any discredit to either one of them. It was mostly because mom had two more children within three years of me. And so I suppose I was the one given the most trouble, so they shipped me out to grandma's house. And I can't explain or know why exactly it all ended up that way, but from about age three, I lived with my grandmother and granddad. And so my granddad was more of the father to me than my actual father was. And that's okay. God provided someone to me to be a godly father and mother. Now all parents are accountable to God. And so when I was disciplining my three boys, what I tried on occasion to get across to them is the reason that I care for you and discipline you is because I am disciplined by my heavenly father. The same way, I am subject to my father God. And so if I could get them to understand the link between God, myself, and them, 
then they would understand why I could say to them without hesitation, take out the trash, you know, and do it right now. And I wanted to, for them to see the link because a father is subject to our Heavenly Father. And if we can get our children to see that. Therefore, you must obey me. That is how God has ordained that this is to happen. Children, obey your parents as you would the Lord. You know what that reminds me of a little bit? Reminds me of a little bit of the scripture, I believe, where it, Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now there again we have an illustration. Husbands, to love their wives as Christ loved the church, and in premarital counseling, I always try to get the couple to say and answer, how did Christ love the church? When you answer that question, how did Christ love the church? And you know the answer to that. He loved the church because he died on the cross and sacrificed himself for the church. Husbands, when the Bible says love your wives as Christ loved the church, now that's a tall order. That is an order to be an example of Christ in the sacrifice that we live towards our wives. Now that's not always easy. And I certainly can't stand here claiming perfection in being all that a husband and all that a father could be. And so the father is our example and our guide. Now let me share something that might be a surprise to you. Fatherhood does not really come totally natural to a father. It's not so much an instinct. Now, yes, there is a natural love that I think is there. But the point I want to make, to be a good, godly father requires learning and being taught how to be a godly father. I'm thankful for um, a ministry such as Focus on the Family. When I was younger and my boys were smaller and our family was growing, Dr. James Dobson, the ministry he had in Focus on the Family was a terrific way to learn some techniques and ways to be a godly father. Some fathers seem to neglect their children for what other interests I'm, you can imagine. And children suffer very greatly with neglect. Children obey your parents, and that can be said so, so enthusiastically when the parents are godly people. Today, many fathers are punished for lack of child support, and we grieve at something like that tremendously. A godly father, his goal is to see his children come to the Lord in his lifetime. That's the ultimate goal. Teach a youth about the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is Proverbs 22, 6. Teaching our children the way we should go. I want to say that I am so blessed and have been privileged to baptize all three of my, my boys. And I wish every father could even know the experience. And I have toyed around, I've, I've considered and thought, what would be wrong with having a father come right in the baptistry and assist in the baptism of their own children? Man, I think that could be a, a meaningful experience. And I know it was for me as a father and as a pastor just to be able to have that privilege. When Matthew was baptized, he was the last one to be baptized. I wanted to get a little bottle and get a little sample <laughs> of that water <laughs> and just keep it 
and say this is some of the water that Matthew was baptized in. Now I didn't do it. But I tell you, when that water was draining out, I just uh, had a special feeling about that. This is the water my son was baptized. A godly father learns from our heavenly father. The Bible is completely filled with how it is that our Heavenly Father treats us. The way He disciplines us. The Bible says that no discipline is pleasant at the moment, but it brings about the peaceable fruit of righteousness in the lives of those who experience it. Now that's what, that's what we're hoping to do in the lives of our children. When we discipline them, we're hoping to bring about the fruit of obedience, which is the same as righteousness, in a sense. The, our Father God loves us, and I hope that as a Father and all of us here together can know personally the love of God. Just think about the, the chorus we just sing, or the contemporary hymn, A Good, Good Father. You're a good, good father. That's who you are. He is a loving father, a loving God. He loves us and values each one of us. You know, I often think we forget about our value in God the Father's eyes. How does God value us? In that he would send his son to die on the cross to save us. How does the father love us? Now, number two, a father gives more of himself to his family than he gives in gifts. Now, did you get that? The father gives more of himself than he gives in gifts. Many fathers have tried to buy their children's love. A few years ago, it was at a motorcycle event. I was a little rebellious on a Memorial Day weekend. My brother talked me into going to Washington, D.C. at the big motorcycle event where they ride for the veterans in Washington, D.C. I didn't ride in, in the ride itself. We just attended. <laughs> There must have been a million motorcycles in Washington, D.C. You could hardly find room to park a motorcycle. In the first place we parked, it wasn't long until the park police came along and ran us off. I had to go find another place. But I was sitting with a young uh, man there who was a high school buddy of mine somewhat, and he was married now with children. And he took opportunity to share a little bit with me, and he said, Randy, he said, you know, it doesn't matter what you give your children. And that just kind of came out of nowhere. And I, I said, what? His name was John. I said, what'd you say, John? And he shook his head. He said, you know, it doesn't matter what you, what you give to your children. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he was, went on to express the disappointment that he had had with his children. And I think one daughter had perhaps gotten pregnant and another son had been into this or that. And he said, you know, money doesn't mean a thing. And I didn't get into the, the specifics of what he meant by, by the money, but I assumed that he had spent a lot on his children perhaps. Fathers cannot substitute money or lavish gifts for the love they can give from themselves. And it's a tempting thing. It's an easy trap to fall into. And we want as children to have our father's presence. I would praise the father who has maintained the proper balance between work and home. And I have struggled with that balance myself. Billy Graham said one of his regrets was not having 
the time to spend with his children as much as he would have liked to. I've heard one of his children say that Billy Graham was away from home for up to six months at a time. Now that's a heavy burden. But you know, we try to accomplish things, and as workers on the job, we try to impress, and we try to achieve, and I want to get promoted, and I want to make good money, and I want to do all that, and you know what I believe? When I'm doing all that, I'm doing it for my family. That's what I say. I convince myself that I'm doing this for my family, and so I charge forward. And at the same time, if I'm not careful, I might be neglecting my family. Proverbs 23, 4. Don't wear yourself out to get rich and start, stop giving attention to it. As soon as your eyes fly to the riches, it disappears. For it makes wings for itself and flies like an eagle to the sky. You know, I'm a young father. I had several goals of mine. I wanted to build a nice house. I wanted late model cars. I still want a boat. I wanted a camper. My brother-in-law, Christy's brother, said, don't get a camper, you can borrow mine. So one day we were up there sitting in his camper there in Oakland, Maryland, and I looked at this camper and I said, Bob, this camper's too big. I don't even have anything to pull this camper. Well, he said, you can have a pickup. I said, Bob, I can't take your pickup and your camper. I'd be afraid to do that. And so you know what we decided? He's going to drive his pickup and he's going to pull his camper down and park it in our driveway. And Christy and I is going to come out and spend a couple of nights in the camper in our driveway. I think that worked just fine. That way we'll get the camper experience right there. And then, of course, we want vacations. I want motorcycle. I want this. I want that. I know, you know, I find that none of those things are as important as giving myself to my family. Today, we must act to honor our father and our mother for that matter. It's the big ten. Does your father deserve the honor that he should get today and I hope you can say with a resounding yes he does he's been a good father a godly father most fathers do work faithfully at their jobs most fathers by far give unselfishly to their families most fathers live a life that's sacrificially lived in love to their families and most fathers will be there for you whenever you want them or need them the rest of your life. And that's what I find now. I have three sons and I want to be with them the rest of their lives no matter what. And they've each had various struggles. But I've tried to come alongside them at that time. Now, a father disciplines his children, and lastly, I have to cut this short, but fathers don't stir up anger in your children. Don't discipline in your children in a way that causes them to be angry or rebellious, even in the way we do it. There is a right way and a wrong way, and stirring up anger is the wrong way. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children. Here we go again. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. What's the greatest father example? That is our heavenly father. We must be careful how we administer discipline, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Well, I certainly have not been able to give an all-inclusive and detailed a bit of information about being a godly father but I hope that what I have brought forward has caused all of us to consider the value of a wonderful and godly father that I hope we have let's pray together Heavenly Father if we 
have a living father today. We are sure thankful for them. And if they are still a godly influence in our lives and have been, that is just something to be so, so thankful for. Lord, if our fathers have passed on and they are but memories, I pray, Lord, that it's good memories that we have of them. And then, Lord, are we father today? And as we are in that role yet today, no matter what age our children, then, Lord, we ask you to guide us that we might be the best example and role model and even a teacher yet of what it is to be a godly person and that we can influence our children and grandchildren in that way. That would be of such great, great value to us. So I pray these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.